Today we're going to conclude our series that we've been in for several weeks on spiritual warfare. The Bible teaches us the reality of spiritual warfare. That there is an enemy, but greater is he who's in us than he who's in the world. Amen? Today we're going to look at a passage of scripture that is, is really amazing because God gives Judah a tremendous victory. And he, he gives them a victory in a very interesting way. And as they march into battle, the army is behind the singers. They're behind the choir. The choir is going forward. And the army's behind them in battle. And that sounds strange, doesn't it? But they were worshiping. And I've entitled the message today, Worship and Warfare. Worship and Warfare. Why do we begin our services with worship? And not just singing one or two songs, but we have an extended time of worship. Well, I think we're going to see why in this text today. And I want you to join me there. It's a powerful story from verses uh, 1 through verse 30. We, can, we have the story contained. I'm not going to read all of that simply because of time's sake. But I encourage you later this afternoon when you're at home and relaxing to, to read the entire story because it's powerful. But I want us to look at this tremendous battle that took place. And I want us to notice something. What is verse 2? Let's look at verse 2. It says, Then some came and told Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat was the king, the king of Judah. And this is what they told him. A great multitude is coming against you from beyond the sea, from Cyrus. And they are in Hazazon, Tamar, which is in Gedi. Verse 3 says, And Jehoshaphat feared and set himself to seek the Lord and proclaim a fast throughout all Judah. The first thing I want us to notice there is that there are, is a multitude coming against Judah, coming against God's people. There were three different uh, kingdoms that were peoples that were coming against. They gathered together to come against God's people. And it says the king was afraid. And in this passage, we see that he responds in the midst of that fear. And you may be right now in a similar situation with three kingdoms coming against you. His thoughts were, we're going to be wiped out. There is no future for Judah. There is no hope. We can't stand against these enemies that are all joining together to come against us. And we experience that. You may have experienced that feeling in the past, or you may be experiencing that right now, or you may in the future experience that, but that's how the enemy works. He wants to come and he wants to tell you, you don't have a future. He wants to tell you that the enemy's greater, the enemy's going to outnumbers you, and the enemy is going to wipe you out. That's how he works. But in this story, we see the answer for God's people. I want us to notice a few other things here. The enemy comes and he's marching into your circumstances. What is your response? He's shouting, it's all over. He's shouting, you don't have a future. What is your response? I love Jehoshaphat because he's, he's real. It says that he was afraid. Sometimes we think as Christians, well, I'm never going to experience fear. Yes, you are. You're human. But I want you to notice how he responds to fear. What was his response to fear? Did he call the, the elders in the that were surrounding him, the wit that gave him wisdom and input? Did he say, let's call everybody together, get our, our best 
uh, debaters together, the best uh, politicians that can go out and maybe work through this. He, he didn't choose that. He didn't say, well, let's get all the gold and all the silver and bring it together and let's give them a tribute and maybe they'll go back home. He also didn't say, well, get all of our armies together and let's, let's show that we're strong, that they're going to have to, to really fight us to, to win the battle. And those are ways that most of us respond today when we are in a battle with the enemy. We try to bargain with him. Guess what? You can't bargain with the enemy. We try to play politics with him. Well, you leave me alone, devil, and I'll leave you alone. Guess what? That didn't work. And sometimes we're just quick and we think, we've got to do something right now. We've just got to do something. Have you ever been there? And usually when we just respond and react, we do the wrong thing. But I love the fact that Jehoshaphat, he was afraid, but church, there's good news for you and I because he was afraid. It did not disqualify him from the great victory that God had planned for him. Amen? So when, next time you're afraid, how are you going to respond? Are you going to give up? Are you going to say, well, we're just going to be annihilated, there's no future? Or are you going to do what Jehoshaphat did? Let's, let's look and see what he did. He had fear in the face of a crisis, but it didn't disqualify him for what God had planned. What makes the difference is how we respond in the middle of the crisis. Look at verse uh, 3. What does Jehoshaphat do? It says, and Jehoshaphat feared. Okay, he was still struggling with fear. He was in a battle with fear, but then listen to what he did. He set himself to seek the Lord and proclaim a fast throughout all Judah. He sought the Lord. Church, what, what do you do when you're in the midst of a crisis situation in your life? Do you, do you just say, okay, devil, you win? Or do you say, God, I know that you are able. I know that you are my protector. You are everything that I need. Do you begin to enter into prayer and cry out to God and seek his face? And in this case, they fasted. Now, everybody who thinks fasting is a dirty word, raise your hand. Most of us don't like to fast. But Jehoshaphat understood that fasting wasn't simply going through a spiritual ritual. He understood the power of fasting. And church, we need to understand that as well. Amen? If you want to see a great chapter on fasting and the importance of fasting, it's in the book of Isaiah chapter 58. And in that chapter, in verse 6, God explains what his idea of a fast truly is. Listen to what he says. Is this not the fast that I have chosen to loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, to let the oppressed go free, and that you break every yoke? Fasting is one of the weapons that God has given us. Our weapons are not carnal. They are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, Scripture says. And fasting isn't simply saying, God, I want to twist your arm a little here so that you'll answer my prayer, so that you'll hear what's going on, so that you'll act. And it's not saying, you know, if I fast, God's going to see me and know that I'm really sincere. Fasting is acknowledging, church, that we need God more than anything else. It's acknowledging that we need God more than even the sustenance that feeds our bodies. We need God. And so fasting is coming and saying, Lord, I see what your word says about fasting, that it breaks the yoke 
of the enemy. It breaks the chains of bondage. Are you with me, church? That's how he responds. Now, some people take this passage of Scripture, and it's, it's almost amusing because they'll, they'll come up with this own idea that, well, if you're facing a big battle, all you got to do is sing. And they get that from this chapter. Next time you're in a battle, all you got to do is start singing a little melody. But I want you to see the depth of this passage. There's much more than just singing a little song in the midst of a battle. That's kind of silly. You say, oh, my wife had a car wreck. She's in the hospital. But I know everything's going to be okay because I'm just going to sing a little song. Or my teenager is getting in the wrong crowd and pulling away from God. And, and, but I know I, I can just sing a little song. I'm going to sing a little song. No, there's so much more to this text. And it begins with the king understanding God is my answer. And I'm going to fast because God's word tells me that fasting is a spiritual weapon. We are not going to sit here and take what the enemy's dishing out. We're going to go on a counterattack and see the victory of God come into this situation. Next time you're attacked, you need to have that attitude. Lord, we're going to pray and I'm going to fast and I'm going to believe that you're going to break the bondage of the enemy. Break this, give me a breakthrough in this situation. How many ever need a breakthrough in life? How many realize God is the God of breakthrough? Jehoshaphat has great spiritual understanding more than many of us today as Christians do. He recognizes the spiritual forces and he takes a counterattack. But let's look at something else. They're going to end up, yes, with a choir singing. But what else is behind that? They were people who understood the resources that they had in the spiritual realm. I want to say that again. They were people that understood the resources that they had in God in the spiritual realm. They understood the power of prayer. They understood the power of fasting. Now look at verse 6. And said, O Lord God of our fathers, he's praying. Are you not God in heaven? And do you not rule over all the kingdoms of the nations? And in your hand is there not power and might so that no one is able to withstand you? Verse 7 says, Are you not our God who drove out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and gave it to the descendants of Abraham, your friend forever? This is not just a little Mamby pamby routine prayer. He is recognizing the greatness of God and recognizing what God has done for his forefathers. And he's saying, God, you're still our God. You gave us this land. You gave us this promise. And Lord, I'm turning to you because I know that you are great. You are mighty. That nothing's impossible for you. So he's remembering the history of what God has done in the past. Next time you're in a battle, I want you to think about the history of battles that you've gone through in the past or battles that your forefathers have gone through. When we read the Bible and we see the battles, that's what we're doing. There are spiritual forefathers and foremothers, if you will. There are those that have gone through these things and God intervened in their life and it brings hope to us that if God moved in the life of Jehoshaphat and moved in the life of Judah and brought about this great victory where all they had to do was go forward and sing a little song, then God can do it again. God can do it again. They were doing what I like to call living in the grip of God's greatness. And every Christian should be living in the grip of God's greatness. That you know that God has his hand on your life. 
And no matter what you're facing, no matter what you're going through, that you're living in the grip of His great and mighty power. Jesus said it this way in John chapter 10, verse 27 through 29. He said, My sheep hear My voice, and I know them, and they follow Me, and I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of My hand. Did you hear that? Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. And no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. That's living in the greatness of God. Church, I want to ask you today, are you living in the greatness of God? Do you know that he, His hand is on you? That He's not going to le- let go of you? That He's got everything under control. That He is mighty. That He's awesome. He's wonderful. He's greater than we can even begin to imagine today. Do you believe that? Anybody remember that little song when you were a kid? He's got the whole world in His hands. He's got the whole world in His hands. He's got the whole world in his hands he's got the whole world in his hands he does amen he's got everything under his control he is sovereign he is god god alone there is no other god than our creator i love that so go out with confidence trust in the word of the lord The faith that's demonstrated here in prayer is because of the history of God dealing with His people. People wonder how you acquire faith. I hear that all the time. The disciples even said, Lord, increase our faith. Well, the Bible tells us in Romans chapter 10, verse 17, so then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Amen. Your faith isn't going to grow unless you're reading God's Word. But when you're reading God's Word and feeding on the Word of God, guess what? Faith is going to grow. You're going to see how God works His redemptive purposes in the lives of His people. And you will know that God will work His redemptive purposes in your life as well. I'm thankful for that today, aren't you? Church, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. How many realize that God doesn't play favorites? In fact, God's word in James tells us that to show favoritism is a sin. And if God's word says it's a sin, he's certainly not going to be a partaker of it. Scripture says he's no respecter of persons. That means you can trust God. He will be there for you just like he was for Jehoshaphat and Judah. When it comes to God's plans for your life, Psalm 138 verse 8 sums it up. It says, the Lord will perfect that which concerns me. The Lord will perfect that which concerns me. That God's always working for our benefit, for our blessing behind the scenes. We may not recognize His working all the time. Other times it's going to be evident to us. Just recently God did something Wonderful and and, and opened up an opportunity for our church to start ministering in Pakistan. Last night at 10 o'clock, I was in my office and I was preaching to a church in Pakistan. And one thing I thought was really neat, on the very front row, they had a big cushy couch. And the farther you went back, the harder the chairs got. And I thought, hey, I like that idea. But God opened up that new door for, for our church that we, we can minister. I had a translator, and it's, it's interesting trying to get used to preaching and stopping and letting him translate, and then you preach, and then he, you stop. But the people were touched, and that's what matters. God used it for his glory. And I believe God's got greater things for our church. I believe God's got greater things for you. 
So you better get ready because there's going to be an onslaught of the enemy that sooner or later is going to come against you. And how are you going to react? I hope it's like Jehoshaphat. Lord, we're going to acknowledge you in the history of what you've done in your people. And Lord, we're just going to worship you. We're going to trust in you. We're going to seek you. We're going to fast and pray. Now look what happens in verse 14. Everybody look at verse 14. The Spirit of God came upon Jehaziel. Now he was the son of a prophet recognized as a prophet in Israel. And God gives him a message for King Jehoshaphat. Look at verse 15. And he said, listen all you of Judah and you inhabitants of Jerusalem. And you, King Jehoshaphat, thus says the Lord to you. Do not be afraid nor dismayed because of this great multitude. For the battle is not yours but God's. Tomorrow go down against them. They will surely come up by the ascent of Ziz. And you will find them at the end of the brook before the wilderness of Jeruel. You will not need to fight in this battle. How many like that? How many realize many times we do fight in the battle? And they spiritually, they were fighting in the battle. But God is saying, you're not going to have to fight this battle. Position yourselves, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord who is with you. O Judah and Jerusalem, do not fear or be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them, for the Lord is with you. What a powerful passage, amen? Now, I want want to read that through that again, but I want you to apply it to your life. Apply it to where you are. Apply it to the situation that you're facing. The Lord says to you, do not be afraid or dismayed because of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours but God's. Tomorrow, go against them. They will surely come up against the ascent of Ziz, and you will find them at the end of the brook before the wilderness of Jeruel. You will not need to fight in this battle. Position yourselves, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord. Who is with you, O Judah and Jerusalem? Do not fear or be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them, for the Lord is with you. Turn to somebody today and tell them, the battle belongs to the Lord. In this passage, the word that's translated dismayed literally means to be cut down. Don't let the enemy come and cut you down. Know who you are in Jesus. Now look at verse 18. And Jehoshaphat bowed his head with his face to the ground. And all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem bowed before the Lord, worshiping the Lord. God had given them a great promise. And now they're overwhelmed with that promise. They're bowing before God in reverence and they're worshiping Him. Verse 19 says, Then the Levites of the children of the Kohathites and the, the children of the Korahites stood up to praise the Lord God of Israel with voices loud and high. They were having a hallelujah shouting party. And I, I guarantee you, if I had been there and I, in that situation and I had received that word from God, I would have been right there with them. Hallelujah! Amen. That's a great response when you've been in a battle and God comes through for you. Don't hold it back. Have a shouting hallelujah party. Thank you, Lord. We need to understand in this passage, when this prophetic utterance came forth, there were the people received that from the Lord. They trusted in it. Today, Many times people, uh, when we have someone that's, the Lord's laid a message on their heart, they'll come and ask me and they'll share it with me. And if I feel that it's uh, what the Lord would say to the congregation, I'll say, yes, sure, share that with us. I want to make sure that you understand, though, when somebody stirs the heart of, of someone and they bring a word from the Lord for our congregation, we do not equate that with Scripture. I don't take that and turn to the end of Revelation and say, here's another verse. I'm going to write it into God's Word. And some people think that that we do that. And that's, that's silly. We don't do that. 
But what happens, God is laying a word on our hearts, someone in our congregation, that will point to a truth in God's word. And it's reminding us of how God loves us and and wants to minister to us and encourages us or challenges us. And so we see that God spoke in this way. And I believe God's the same yesterday, today, and forever. I still believe in the gifts of the Holy Spirit according to Scripture. Now something else I want us to see. The Lord speaks and He tells them, do not be afraid or dismayed. The battle's not yours, but the battle is the Lord's. You and I have nothing on our own to stand up against the enemy. You may be the next Arnold Schwarzenegger. You may live in the gym. You may have biceps and triceps and all the other seps bulging from your body. But you're not prepared for spiritual battle. God is the only answer for our spiritual battle. Look at verse 20. I love this. It says, so they rose up early in the morning. Why? They're surrounded by the enemy. Because during the night, faith began to rise up in the leadership and in the hearts of the people. And they were believing God's word for them. They were ready to see God bring about the battle. They were taking that stance of faith and believing God's got this. And I want to see what God's going to do to the enemy. That's the attitude we ought to have. Amen? When we encounter someone who's struggling... And there's a life-controlling issue in their life. We come alongside them. We wrap our arms around them. We begin to pray with them. We begin to fast. And we take that stance. God's up to something. God's going to win this battle. God, I want to see what you're going to do in the heart and the life of this person. Next in verse 20, let's look at this. Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, O Judah, and you inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God, and you shall be established. Believe his prophets, and you shall prosper. And when he had consulted with the people, this is interesting. Jehoshaphat could have just made an edict. He could have said, we're going to put the choir in front. The army's going to follow behind. But he didn't. He consulted with the people, and it says he appointed those who should praise the beauty of His holiness as they went out before the army and were saying, praise the Lord for His mercy endures forever. He was consulting with the people. They were probably revisiting what the prophet had said. The words, the promise of God. And they came to the conclusion, God said we're not going to have to fight this battle. Our army doesn't even need to go out. God's going to do it. And somebody, we're not told in the text if it was Jehoshaphat or if it was one of his uh, leaders or if it was just a person in, the, in Judah. But somebody had the great idea, well, since God's got this and we don't have to fight, why don't we just send those who lead us in worship out in front of everybody? And the army didn't even need to go except for The spoils, it was going to take them three days to gather up all the spoils that God was going to bless them with after the battle. How many like that? So it was an act of faith. So it wasn't just saying, church, it wasn't just saying, well, we faced the battle, so we're going to put our singers out in front and They're all going to lead us in a little ditty and we're going to get happy. It was a sign of their faith. It was a sign that they believed that God was the Almighty God. They believed His promises, that He had a a, a future for their nation, and God's got a future for you. They they believed that what God did in the lives of those that trusted Him in the past, God would do today. 
And church, I want to tell you, what God has done in the lives of those in the past, God will do in your life today. He will. And they said, now let's demonstrate our faith. Let's take that position of faith. And we're going to send the worshipers that are going to lead our, our army to worship. And the, and the word there that's used in the text, in the original, is yada for praise. And yada literally means to praise God with uplifted hands and give Him thanks. So I want you to picture the choir going before the army and the entire army of God. They're not holding their weapons and getting ready to use them. They're walking with their hands lifted up to God, praising Him for the victory. Amen. And church, some of us need to come to that place where we're not worried about grabbing a weapon and, and saying, I've got to, I don't know what I'm going to do. The enemy's going to come against me. We need to come to the place. The battle belongs to the Lord God Almighty. What he did back then, he does today. And he will always do for his people. He is on the throne. He is in control. He is my God. And I'm going to trust him. I'm going to worship him. Amen. I'm going to lift my hands to the Lord in thanks and in praise. Because the battle belongs to my God. The battle belongs to the Lord. I love that. How about you? Do you love that? Church, I want to ask you today. Are you in a battle today? How are you responding? How are you going to respond the next time you are in a battle if you're not in a battle right now? And I'm not saying sing a little ditty. I'm saying you begin to worship God because of His promises. Because of what He's done for you in the past. Because He says He is in control. That the battle belongs to Him. And no matter what you're facing, God loves you. He is for you. He is not against you. Amen? I want the worship team to come if they would. And I want, the, I want you to, I don't know what you'd plan to, to sing as we close. But I want you to sing, sing a hallelujah. Because if you notice, that song relates so powerfully to the text that we just read. And some of us need to take that stance we need to get up early, get excited, because God's got this. I don't know how He's going to do it. God brought confusion to the enemy, and all three of those nations turned on themselves, and they wiped each other out, and Israel didn't have to raise a finger in that battle. And God can bring confusion to the enemy that's coming against us. Amen? I want you to stand with me. And if you're here today and you've never made a commitment to Christ, I want to invite you to make a commitment to Jesus today. Make a commitment to the true and the living God. In just two weeks, we're going to celebrate the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And church, there's nothing better than knowing that you're on God's side. If that's you today, find your way to one of our prayer team. And I'm going to ask the prayer team members to come to the front and around the, the back and, and uh, if we can get at least a couple in the... Thank you, Pastor Todd. In the balcony. also have some exciting news while they're making their way. The, prayer, the chairs have been picked up and they're in transit. Yes. So praise the Lord. 
So pray they arrive before Easter. That's my prayer. I'd love to have the chairs in. And I apologize to everybody who's in the balcony and not able to have a chair. But God's good. I want you to bow your heads with me. And I want to pray for you this morning. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this wonderful passage of Scripture. I thank you for the promises not only to Jehoshaphat and Judah for this time, but the promises that it it gives each one of us. That this battle that we're in belongs to the Lord. But we're to take that stance. We're to pray. And we're to fast. And we're going to see the salvation of the Lord. For those that right now are struggling financially. Maybe they've lost their job. Maybe they're not able to make it from paycheck to paycheck because of inflation. Lord, I pray that they would just follow the example that we've read today. That they would pray and seek your face. Lord, that they would fast something, Lord. Set it aside acknowledging they need You more than anything in this life. And Lord, that they would take that stance of trusting in the promises of God. And they would be excited to see how You work things out. And Lord, that they would just lift their hands in praise and in thanks to You. Lord, if there's someone who's struggling in a relationship, maybe it's in a marriage, maybe it's with a co-worker on the job, maybe it's a relationship with a, a young adult or teenager in the home. Lord, whatever that situation is, we give it to You today. And we thank You, Lord, that the battle belongs to You. Lord, maybe it's a situation where the doctors have come and they've said, There's no hope. There's no future. There's nothing that we can do. Lord, I pray that they respond like Jehoshaphat. And they seek You. And they pray. They acknowledge how You've worked in the past and how that You still work today. And Lord, most of all, if it's spiritually, if anyone's here today and they haven't made that commitment to You. Lord, I pray that today they would bring it all to You. Open their heart to You. Open their life to You. Say, God, I want to know You. I want to know Your power. I want to know Your strength in the midst of fear. I want to know the victory, Lord, that You have for Your people. Lord, we ask it in Your precious and wonderful name. If you don't have a need today, I want you to join the worship team and I want you to just sing this song. And I want you to picture yourself as one of those soldiers that the battle's been won and you're not having to fight and you're just praising God for the victory. But if you have a need today and you're in the midst of the battle, find one of our prayer team today and we'd we'd love for you to pray with with them today for you. Thank you for joining us today. We look forward to connecting with you next time. And don't forget, you can support us by giving through the Church Center app or by going online at summitwc.com give.